this is what separate, you know, I, I would, you know, we talked about the Myers-Briggs personality test and all that kind of stuff. I would like to see how much someone's personality lines up with whether or not they like the Psalms, whether they like the epistles, whether, you know, I can almost guarantee that people who are much more creative and, oh, like, you know, they like singing and all that stuff, they love the Psalms and they love reading the book. I'm just like, oh, I hate it. <laughs> um, but for a contrast between how poetry relates to narrative or the epistles, think of an engineer reading plans for a jet engine versus somebody reading Shakespeare. I mean, it sounds completely different. I mean, they're not only different genres, they're completely different, like, planes of existence. Like, if you know somebody who's an engineer, and you put Shakespeare in front of them, and it's like, come on, you're a smart dude. Read Shakespeare. It would, they, they would hate it. And this is what this is like. We have to understand, parallelism is, a, is an idea. And Hebrew poetry where they rhyme ideas <coughs> more than they rhyme words. So we in English like to rhyme words. But if you look in Psalm 19, for example, and this is all throughout <coughs> poetry, this is a very clear example of it. 19 verse 8. The Lord's precepts are fair and make one joyful. The Lord's commands are pure and give insight for life. So precepts, commands. He's saying two different things about the same thing. God's word is right. God's words are just. They endure forever. So it's those kinds of things. In the verse, it'll say this thing, then another thing. Sometimes they'll contrast in parallelism. This thing and then the opposite thing. But they're more comparing ideas. Um, acrostics, where, you know, we know what acrostics are, right? You've got a word going down. It says dad and dutiful, awesome, dope. I don't know. <laughs> that's that's an acrostic for that. You know? <coughs> well, they would have these too. And Psalm 119 is the most classic example of it. Longest chapter in the Bible. I looked ahead in our reading plan, by the way, to see when Psalm 119 <laughs> fell. So I was thinking, that's got to be its, just its own reading for the day, right? Nope. They slap on like seven other chapters and Psalm 119. So... Prepare for that one. It's long. <laughs> but uh, because there's, what, 22 letters, I think, in the Hebrew alphabet? And if you read it, the, the first eight verses say Aleph, which is the first A in the Hebrew alphabet. And then, every, now, obviously, this doesn't translate in English, but in Hebrew, every verse of those first eight verses all start with the first Hebrew letter. Then the next eight are Bet, the second letter. And those eight verses all start with bet. Then the next one, and every one of them is a, an acrostic that way. So they're like little songs for children, easy to remember and easy to sing. <clears throat> um, figurative language is huge. Um, Proverbs 11.22, for example. Like... <laughs> Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman <coughs> who lacks discretion. Uh, okay. Um, you read that and you think, okay, this is obviously not good, but what is a simile and metaphor supposed to do? They paint you a picture. And you think, oh, a gold ring in the snout of a pig. What does that make you think? Like, I don't know. When I hear that, I think, man, that gold ring would be nice to have. You know, how often do you stumble across a, across a gold ring and reach down there to get it? Oh, gross! It's attached to this pig. Who, you know, maybe he's gonna try to like, you know, knock you down and eat you or whatever. You know, it's a disgusting <laughs> thing or whatever. And it's like, well, what you think of when you think of a gold ring and the pigs? Uh, Nostril, that's like a beautiful woman who lacks discretion. It's like, oh man, I'd really like to have that. And you get closer, it's like, oh man, that was a mistake. <laughs> so, uh, so some of them are funny that way. It's much more funny than just to say, hey, don't go after women that 
lack discretion. Look at that. It's like, no, think of a pig. You know, like, a, like a pig returns to its vomit. <laughs> so, you know, that kind of meadow. Or a dog returns to its vomit, rather. A pig returns to its the mud. That kind of imagery. Uh, metaphor, classic. Um, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So you're supposed to think about that. It's like, what does that mean? To have a shepherd, to need a shepherd, and the fact that God is my shepherd, and the description of, and, and so just like English poetry, where good poetry is deep, you're supposed to just sit and think about it. Like, what image does that con- does that bring up and conjure in my mind? And when you when when you can grasp that imagery, then it's much more powerful. Oh wow! Like a shepherd. Like, what does a shepherd do? And how does he care for the sheep? So. Very powerful stuff. You know, hyperbole comes across in poetry a lot. Um, and, and in poet, poetic language, we use it. You know, I'm going to say something ridiculous, but man, the Lions completely destroyed the, the Patriots. I don't see that's ridiculous. But they didn't completely destroy them. Everyone walked off the field intact and alive and all that kind of stuff. But we're exaggerating. And that kind of stuff's okay. Like, if and that's why it's important to know when I'm reading poetry, hyperbole is okay. If I'm reading an account of what actually happened, though, and it uses hyperbole like that, and it's like, wait, am I supposed to take this literally? Like, they they really destroyed you know those people? It's like, what's going on? Personification. Well, the heavens don't say they're. It's just matter and planets and all that kind of stuff. Yes, but right. here it's them speaking. They're, they're saying something. Um, and then anthropomorphisms. We've talked about that already. Attributing human characteristics to things that are not human. Like God. God doesn't have arms. So when we talk about the strong right arm of the Lord, you know what's being talked about. But something can be figurative and real at the same time. When we say someone's speaking figuratively or symbolically or spiritually, that doesn't mean that they're not communicating something real. Again, going back to the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. That's true. That's a true statement, but it's not literally true. They're not saying something. You can't like tune in and and hear words coming out of the heavens. Um, so for an example, Song of Solomon, that's a, you know, we weren't allowed to read this book in, in Bible school unless you were married. Um, I still feel a little weird reading it now. <laughs> like, I mean, it's, it's, and uh, so kind of an, an aside about Song of Solomon, you read a lot of like the, you know, church, old, old church tr- interpretations of Song of Solomon, and it gets into the oh, this is just a parable and a, a song about Christ in the church. That's what. That's all it means. No, it's a song about a man and his wife and their wedding night. That's, that's what it's about. But, you know, ancient church people thought sex was a bad thing, so they kind of spiritualize it away. But when you look in chapter 4, the wedding night, praise for the bride. Oh, you are beautiful, my darling. You are beautiful. Your eyes... Behind your veil are like doves. Your hair is like a flock of female goats descending from Mount Gilead. It's like, what in the world does that mean? Uh, going to get some that night. Like, I, I, don't, yeah, I don't know. What's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> your, your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn sheep coming up from the washing place. <laughs> Each of them has a twin, and not one of them is missing. So that's pretty hot. She's got all her teeth. (laughs) Your lips are like a scarlet thread. Your mouth is lovely. Your forehead behind your veil is like a slice of pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David. <laughs> I don't know what in the world. Yeah, it has long, strong <laughs> neck. I don't know. And you can keep reading, and so that it gets even. Drawing a picture as you're It gets even more say, graphic than that. Right, so. yeah. <laughs> we'll end it there. But it's real. I mean, he's describing. He's talking about his wife or whatever. And he's using figurative language. So 
It's important when we read poetry. Slow down. Think about what does it mean? Goats <laughs> coming down a mountain. I I guess I interpret that to mean if you see goats, they're going whoop, whoop, and like popping down. You know, maybe she's got wavy hair. That's. <laughs> Their hair really flows. Yeah, flows. It's like she's got a big afro or something. I don't know. <laughs> Wisdom literature. You got Solomon here with the two women fighting about their about their kids. The wisdom literature. So Proverbs is the most famous, Ecclesiastes, Job. It's a search for how to live well. That's the best way to describe the wisdom literature. So, in it, you have to understand that there's this, maybe assumption is a better word, of a divine order. That things operate in a certain way. If I throw this coffee off the table, there's a natural order of things, gravity, it's going to fall to the ground. It's not always true. There can be other things that happen that prevent that from happening. You know, planes fly. So that defies the law of gravity. Not everything that goes up must come down. Sometimes it fly away. Um, but there's a divine order of how life operates. And, and in it, you've got this contrasting the wise versus the fool. And we have to understand in wisdom literature, these are not morally neutral concepts. In our culture, we might think, you know, this is a really wise person. Or, yeah, it's pretty foolish. That's just... We look at that in terms of, oh, that person's knowledgeable, and that person doesn't isn't all that knowledgeable. That's not necessarily a moral thing in our culture. It's just you just need to learn more. In the scriptures, that's not the case. Being a wise person or being a fool. Now, there's different words for fool in Hebrew. In one, you know, Proverbs will sometimes call it like a simpleton, and a naive person. That's just a person who's just, you know, doesn't know anything. He needs to learn more. But there's different degrees of fool in the wisdom literature and when you get to the worst of the worst you know, the fool says in his heart there is no god it's just at that point it's like this is just a hard-hearted person against the things of the lord so we need to know when we read a wise person behaves this way this is a, a moral question it's not just good advice per se um but it is pragmatic living according to the proverbs it's not only like God said this, so you must do it. It also, it works. Okay, not always. They're, they're general truisms, but you, you want to live the way that the wisdom literature says because things will go better for you if you do. When you violate them, things will go worse for you. Just like if you jump off of a high building, there's an order to things. It's not going to go well for you depending on high that, how high that building is. Um, so it's, it's less of thus says the Lord, and it's more of, listen, my son, to what I'm trying to tell you. It, it's, it's an observation of the sage, the wise man. He's looking out at the world and he's saying, I've observed things in my life, and this is how things tend to work. Thus says the Lord is more like, this is the way things are, and this is the way things, and it's like commands. These are, I don't want to, I hesitate to say that they're not commands, because, you know, they're in God's word, we, we certainly are. But it's not like, if you violate a proverb, you may not suffer the consequence of that, ever, or immediately. It's just, but if you violate it enough times, it's not going to go well for you. Perfect example of this, <clears throat> TJ and I were just talking about this the other day. A perfect illustration of this is in Proverbs 24, verse 30. Here's Solomon, the wise man. It says, I passed by the field of the sluggard, the lazy man, and by the vineyard of the one who lacked sense. I saw that thorns had grown up all over it. The ground was covered with weeds. And its stone wall was broken down. Then I observed it. And I put it, my mind to it. I thought about it. And I saw, I observed, and I took in a lesson. Here's the lesson. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to relax and to rest. And your poverty will come upon you like a bandit, bandit and your need like an armed robber. So he's not saying, 
God told me that if you take too many naps, you're going to end up poor. I mean, that's not God saying that, but he's just saying, he's walking down the street and he looks at this dude's house and, you know, if we were to put it in our own language, you just, you walk through slums, you walk through, like, poverty-ridden areas, and you just look at their house and it's just like, man, it's like this crumbling down, like this window over here is broken. Like, man, what is going on? And he says he did that. I looked at this guy's vineyard and it was like, rocks were all in there and he hadn't even bothered to get the rocks out stone wall to keep out you know not predators but creatures getting in to eat all your stuff that's all crumbled so anything he did grow is going to get eaten by rabbits and stuff and he said i just thought about it i just thought this dude all he does is lay around he doesn't want to work and look what happened to him and then all of a sudden when it comes harvest time he goes out and he's like oh man i don't have any crops it's like well no because you didn't do any work. You were busy laying around all day and not doing it, you know. So that's what he's saying. That's what he's observing. And it's not that, you know, if I take a nap or if I take it easy one day or two days or I'm going to take a little bit of time off of work. It's, but if that becomes your life, you can't be surprised when that's what your life starts to look like. <clears throat> so they're not universally true, but they're normally true. They're situationally true. We mentioned this one last week, but it's worth mentioning again. Proverbs 26, <coughs> 4. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. And right in the next verse, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own opinion. And it's like, well, we know the laws of logic. Two things cannot be true, or two, thing, two opposite things cannot be true at the same time. I can't be standing here teaching you about hermeneutics and be sitting at my house watching a Jeffrey Dahmer documentary at the same time. That's not logically possible. But how are we going to, what, so am I supposed to answer a fool according to his folly or not answer a fool according to his folly? Well, what does the situation dictate? And it might be that you're going to get burned either way, but just know that if you answer a fool according to his folly, you'll be like him. But if you don't, he's going to think, oh man. I must be right in my folly because everyone's agreeing with me. Well, um, so this is what the wisdom literature is like. We have to understand that it's not absolutely true all the time. And especially when you get into Job, here you've got this, all throughout the wisdom literature, it's the righteous man flourishes, the wicked man perishes. Well, is that universally true? You get to Job and you've got an entire book where the opposite happens. You've got a righteous man who has nothing but punishment and, and, and hardship. So, and you have to kind of search through the book of Job to find what's going on there. So, <clears throat> prophetic or apocalyptic language. This is another huge section in the, in the Bible. A lot of the Old Testament is given to this. You, you've got to know the historical context in which the prophet is speaking. And that's incredibly important. Um, there's utilization of poetic language and similes and metaphors all throughout the prophets. Just like the poetry in, in that regard. Where you, you've got to understand, you think of Hosea, all of Hosea is a simile, is a metaphor. Now it literally happened to Hosea, but the point of that book is, God tells Hosea, I want you to go down, find a prostitute, and I want you to marry her. What in the world? <laughs> and she's going to keep going back to her prostitution. And I want you to keep going back and buying her back and bringing her back. So what in the world is the point? God says, that's what my relationship is like with you, Israel. That's what I feel like. And that's a powerful image. Now, again, are you supposed to walk away with the theological concept that God's cool with people marrying prostitutes and all that kind of stuff? Well, he may be okay with that, but that's not the point of Hosea. The point is, when, when Hosea is being mocked and ridiculed by the religious leaders, <laughs> Hosea's wife, what's her name, Gomer? I guess Gomer is the most unattractive <laughs> name ever. <laughs> uh, it's like, what a loser, man. He can't even keep his wife faithful to him, you know? And, Hosea's like, well, how do you think God feels? Can't even keep us faithful to him. Joel, chapter 1, if you read through that short little book, 
God says the, the, the swarming locusts are going to come through and they're going to destroy all of your crops. And then these other kind of locusts are going to come in behind it and they're going to destroy this. And then these other locusts are going to come in behind it. He's not talking about locusts. He's talking about within the context, the Assyrian army is about to come through and they're going to just wave after wave destroy everything in sight. So again, understanding the historical context, what's going on, understanding the imagery, what do locusts do? When they sweep through an area, it's just like destroys everything. There's nothing left. All the crops, everything's gone. So, <clears throat> so the basic messages in the prophets, and this is universal. One, you've sinned, you've broken the covenant. Now, this is not all, you know, the broken the covenant would obviously apply to the Israelites, but there are some prophets that are directed at non-Israelite nations. They're obviously not under the Old Testament covenant, but that does teach us something. Here, I'm going to put this down while I'm moving my hands. It's dangerous. <laughs> yeah, it's dangerous. <laughs> not going to get invited back next week. <laughs> <laughs> there are other nations that are not under this covenant, and yet God is saying you've done X, Y, and Z, and you're going to be punished for it. So what is that? What theological principle does that tell us? We're in error if we think that God only punished the Israelite people in the Old Testament because they were the ones who were in a covenant relationship with them. No. The nations of Moab and Edom and all these other nations, God may not have explicitly told them, here are the Ten Commandments, don't violate them. But he still had problems with what they were doing, and he punished them likewise. So... Um, so you've sinned, you, you violated this covenant, you better repent, or you're going to be judged. That's what a lot of the prophets are. You know, we often think of prophets as predicting the future. I mean, it's kind of predictive in the sense of you're going to get judged if you don't stop doing what you're doing. But a lot of it's just, you need to stop and repent. Think of Jonah going to Nineveh. And, and they did repent, and what did Jonah do? He wouldn't cry about it because he wanted God to destroy the Ninevites. Um, but then there's a hope for a restoration. And I don't want to say this is always because always is always wrong and never is never right. But I think it's nearly always included in every prophet, even to the smallest one chapter prophets in the Old Testament. There's always this hope of the restoration. When God tells the nation of Israel, I'm going to destroy you and I'm going to exile you from the land, and I'm going to punish you for X, Y, and Z. There's always this future vision of, but I'm going to gather you back, and I'm going to send my king, my anointed one, and you're going to be the pinnacle of the world. There's, it's always included in there. Some of the major prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, it's all over the place. It's, but in, even in the smaller ones, there's always that, that element in there. Um... This idea that we have to keep in mind. There's a near view, far view concept in, in prophecy. So a lot of the times the prophets will be speaking to their culture, their immediate situation. Hey, listen, a classic example of this would be in Isaiah. It's talking about here's a sign that's going to be given to you. And, and I apologize, I don't remember the king at the time he's speaking to you. But here's going to be a sign that what God is saying is going to come is going to take place. The virgin will give birth to a child. In his immediate context, it's not talking about like a virgin like Mary, but it's meaning like a young woman, a young maid, maid you know, just a young girl. She's going to give birth to a child, and this is what the child's going to be named, and that's going to be a sign that this is going to happen. But there is also a far view, a, a deeper prophetic vision of it. So then when Mary came and was literally a virgin, gave birth to a child, that's what that prophet was speaking to as well. There's this image as well. This is a little bit harder to conceptualize. Hopefully we can, can picture this. Um, it's called the, the, the mountain peaks of prophecy. So if you can picture, these are mountains, okay? A prophet is standing here and looking and seeing a vision. And this is what he's seeing. From his perspective, this is what he would look like, right? cross overlaid with this crown. But what he doesn't know is that he's seeing one instance here, a huge gap of time, followed by another 
event here. So just like if you were to put your hands like this, wow, those look like they're lined right up, but there's a huge gap in between them. This time, in most prophetic literature is what the time that we're in right now. This is why Paul refers in some 59 times as the mystery of the church. It's part of history that God has kept hidden. He didn't reveal any of this to the prophets. What the prophets saw was this. A Messiah, like the suffering servant type person, and then this ruling and reigning Messiah. Ooh, and they liked that one. They liked the ruling and reigning Messiah. They didn't really know anything about this Isaiah 63, or Isaiah 53? The suffering servant. Yeah, 53. They didn't really know anything about that. So when Jesus came the first time, they missed it, because this is what they were looking at. And a, a perfect example of this. We see it um, right out in the open and referenced by Jesus. <clears throat> in Isaiah 61, and if you remember, Jesus goes to the synagogue and they say, Hey, Jesus, why don't you come up here and do the scriptural reading for today? And he opens up to the book of Isaiah, and he turns to Isaiah 61. And says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, because the Lord has chosen me. He has commissioned me to encourage the poor, to help the brokenhearted, to decree the release of the captives, and the freeing of the prisoners, to announce the year when the Lord will show his favor. And it says he closed the scroll and said, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your ear. And they're sitting there staring at him, saying like, yeah, okay. And then he sits down, and that's it. He says, that's what's going on right now. Releasing the captives, proclaiming freedom, all this kind of stuff. What he left out, and what you would never guess if you just read Isaiah 61. Decree to release the captives, the freeing of the prisoners, to announce the year when the Lord will show his favor. The day when our God will seek vengeance. Well, that happens here. Didn't happen here. But from the prophet's perspective, all he saw was... This one imagery. Well, there's been 2,000 years that have separated the time of God's favor with the time of God's judgment. So <clears throat> that's another element to, to recognize that in the prophets, they didn't know about this time period. And so often their prophecies blend together like that. There goes. Okay, epistles. <clears throat> also important. Does anyone got the time? It's three. Is it three? Okay, let's breeze through this really quickly. And epistles. Again, understanding the historical cultural context and the surrounding audience. I want to—I do want to take a look at this really quick because I think this is just so cool and it illustrates how important it is to know the cultural context and, and the, the when you read an epistle. In Acts 18, this is when Paul's at Corinth. A riot breaks out, as it's wont to do whenever Paul shows up, and it says. Now, while Gallia was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews attacked Paul together and brought him before the judgment seat, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God in a way contrary to the law. But just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of some crime or serious piece of villainy, I would have justified in accepting the complaint of you Jews. But since it concerns points of disagreement about your own laws, settle it yourself. I'm not going to judge you for these things. I'm not going to be a judge for these things. So he then forced them away from the judgment seat. He drove them away, and the Jews looked like a fool because they tried to get Paul trapped. And it says, so they seized Sosthenes, the president of the synagogue, who was probably the guy who was the ringleader of this and made him look like idiots, and they began to beat him in front of the judgment seat. Yet none of these things were of any concern to Gallio. So this guy Sosthenes got some pretty rough treatment. He was the synagogue. He was trying to get Paul persecuted. And they're like, well, Sosthenes, you made us look like an idiot. So we're going to beat you instead. And Galileo's like, I don't care about any of this. Well, then you read the book of 1 Corinthians, and it says, From Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. Well, <laughs> look, I guess he came around and accepted the Lord. Isn't that interesting? We're not, we're not told that in Acts, but if you read 1 Corinthians, he shows up. So it's kind of a cool thing to know. And just remember that these are personal letters from someone to someone. You've got to understand that there's an author, there's an audience. Understanding who those people are helps because we were able to get a picture of what was their relationship to one another. Just like a love letter, if you knew 
who each part people and it's like it makes it more meaningful. If I had to pick up a love letter from someone I don't even know, I'm like, I'm, this doesn't mean anything to me. If I was to pick up a love letter that was addressed to me, it probably wouldn't mean anything to me either. But uh, so, what's the occasion for writing? It's another important thing. Um, is what being written is it occasion based or is it normative? Is it descriptive or prescriptive? When Paul's talking about women wearing head coverings, when he's talking about the Corinthians being baptized for the dead, no idea what that means. Nor does anybody. I mean, the Mormons think that they know, but they don't know any better than anyone else. No idea what's going on. Maybe the Corinthians were into some weird thing where they're being baptized for the dead, and Paul says, hey, you're doing that, and he doesn't say whether it's right or wrong, but um, so we need to know stuff like that. And we won't take a look at this. We've referenced it already, but language is used by different authors. In Romans 3.28, Paul says, We maintain that a man is justified by works apart from the uh, by faith apart from works of the law. And then in James 2.21, he says, So you can see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. We've got a major problem if these two people are talking about the same exact thing, because they're saying polar opposites. But if we recognize that James is not Paul. Maybe there's differences in the language that he's using and how he's using it. So those are questions that need to be asked. And then in the epistles, there's arguments, there's discourse, there's persuasion, there's diatribes, there's all these logical um, tools used, especially when you read the book of Romans. Paul is logically laying out an argument all throughout that book. So if you accept this premise, then he goes on to his next premise, and because you've accepted that first one, you've got to accept the second one. And then the third one, he's just building this case. For what, he's, for what he's talking about. While Faith and Focus is a ministry of in faith, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast don't necessarily reflect the views and opinions of in faith as a mission. If you like what you heard in this episode, why don't you become a monthly supporter of the ministry? It really helps me out $10 a month or whatever the Lord lays on your heart. So if you're interested in becoming a partner, uh, you can text the word discipleship to 41. 41- 444 or head over to infaith.org backslash Dennis dash Sotherby. And if you have any questions or topics that you would like me to address on a future episode of Faith and Focus, why don't you shoot me an email? You can email me at Dennis Sotherby at infaith.org. Just put in the subject line question for Faith and Focus or something like that. Uh, so I can see it, know that it's from you. And know that it's an issue that you'd like me to address.